So this is where we left off in the last video. We found the reflection coefficient and we found the transmission coefficient. So now let's try to interpret these results. So first of all, notice that r plus t is actually equal to 1. And this makes perfect sense because r is the fraction of the wave that ends up bouncing backwards, and t is the fraction of wave that ends up traveling onwards. So since the wave either bounces backwards or keeps on going, if you add them up, uh, both of these fractions, they should add up to equal to 1. And as you can see, this is indeed the case. So you can see that r plus t is indeed equal to 1. So this is one way to make sense of our answer. So another thing we could do is that we could substitute this beta into this, uh, these two expressions over here. And before I do that, I'm also going to substitute out this k over here. And then we call that, originally we defined k as being equal to the square root of 2me divided by h bar. So we're just going to substitute that in. And since we're going to be using beta square, we might as well consider beta square over here. So we have m square alpha square h, to the power, h bar to the power of 4 times k square where k squared is just equal to 2me, and then we can just flip the h bar square over to the top. And then you can see that these cancel out, uh, this cancels out. So you have m alpha squared divided by 2 h bar square e. So this is the value of beta squared. So we can substitute this in uh, for this result. So r, instead of writing it as beta squared divided by 1 plus beta squared, I'm going to write this as 1 plus 1 divided by 1 plus 1 over beta squared. And then this will just become, so this term over here is just going to become 2 h bar square e m alpha squared. So this is the, your reflection coefficient. And then your transmission coefficient is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus just the beta squared. So m alpha squared 2 h bar square e. So these are your two results, your reflection coefficient and your transmission coefficient. And then once again, you can see that this also makes perfect sense because if your energy level is larger, so if E is larger, then this denominator will be smaller. So this entire fraction will be smaller. And this makes perfect sense. If your E is larger, then it will have more ability to get through the direct delta potential. So that's why there will be less wave bouncing backwards. And so that is why when E is larger, then R is smaller. And the reverse is also true for this t over here. If e is larger, then this term is going to be smaller, so the denominator is going to be smaller, so this entire term is going to be bigger, which means more of the wave is going to get past the direct delta potential. And also this makes perfect sense, because if e is larger, then you expect the particle to have enough energy to get through the barrier. So that means that to get through the direct delta potential. So that means this also makes perfect sense. So this is another way to interpret these results that we've obtained. And uh, one thing you should note is that the uh, xi of x that we obtained for this case over here is actually not normalizable. So it's kind of like the case you've, uh, we encountered for the free particle. So the xi of x that we obtained for the free particle is actually not normalizable. And then the final wave function that we obtained is actually a linear combination of a whole bunch of different states uh, corresponding to different energy levels. And uh, the reason is because what we're ending up with is a scattering state. So we call that the potential of something like this. There's a negative spike over here, and the energy level is going to be positive. So you can see that for positive and negative infinity, the energy level is going to be always higher than the potential. So that is why we end up with a scattering state, which is why our xi of x is not going to be normalizable. So that means if our xi of x is not going to be normalizable, so you can see that this result that we have over here, over here this r and this t, this, actually, this is actually the reflection and transmission coefficient for a particular energy level. But since we know that our xi of x is not going to be normalizable, the final wave function that we're going to get is going to be a linear combination, kind of like what we obtained in, uh, in the case of the free particle. So that means that there is not, uh, for a particle inside this potential, it's not going to have a single definite energy level E. So it kind of feels like that this result does not apply because this is the R and T for a single energy level. So these two results can only be interpreted as an approximation. So you can, if your, uh, if your particle has the energy level that is around the value of E, then you can use these two uh, results here as approximations of the fraction of wave that gets reflected and the fraction of wave that gets transmitted. So that's one thing you should take note of. Because xi of x is not normalizable, that's why we need to consider the linear combination. That is why there is the particle does not have a single definite energy level. And so that is why these two results are actually just approximate.
So that is one thing you should note. And one final thing I should point out is the phenomenon of quantum tunneling. So through this example that we've shown you, we can actually also demonstrate the phenomenon of tunneling in quantum mechanics. So let's just draw this graph first. So recall that the potential that we've been considering is negative alpha times the direct delta potential. But then we can also apply all these results for a potential that is that has a positive alpha instead of a negative alpha. And for such a potential, your uh, uh, potential is going to look something like this in a graph. So recall that before it was an infinitely sharp spike that was pointing downwards. This, t this time it's kind of like a wall, it points upwards. So last time it was a well, this time it's a wall. So we have this direct delta barrier instead of a direct delta well. And uh, if you just take this potential, you can, you'll realize that you can just go through all, this, uh, all these steps that we just went through in the past few videos, and you will obtain the same exact reflection and transmission coefficients. And so this is very interesting because what it tells us is that a wave traveling in this direction, when it meets this infinitely high wall, some of it is going to bounce back, so that the amount that is going to bounce back, the fraction that is going to bounce back is going to be equal to r, and the amount that is going to keep on going through this potential is going to be equal to t. So even though there is this infinitely high wall over here, this apparently insurmountable barrier, quantum mechanics tells us that some of the particle is still going to travel through. So there is still going to be a chance that you might find the particle at the right-hand side of this infinitely high uh, barrier over here. And this is actually completely opposite with what you expect in classical mechanics. So in classical mechanics, if you have, uh, let's say, a wall over here, you have a ball that's bouncing around. If this wall is infinitely high, in no way would you expect this, uh, this ball to be able to show up at the other side of the wall. But in quantum mechanics, it tells us because there is transmission coefficient, that means there is a possibility that we might find the particle at the right-hand side of the wall. So this is in a, a phenomenon known as quantum tunneling. So that is, so through this example, you can see uh, the concept of quantum tunneling in action.